So let's cross together the borders of Switzerland to fly down to East Africa, to Tanzania, on the Indian Ocean. Tanzania is a very nice travel destination, where people go generally to hope, taking one's picture, sitting on the back of a lion, or sipping a nice mango juice on a beach in Zanzibar. But next to these benefits of tourism, there is another reality going on there. In part due, in fact, also to this nice and warm climate. But this reality is a daily source of concern for inhabitants. It's the very high child mortality. As a parent there, you have to live with the idea that your child has a one out of 20 chance to die before reaching the age of five years. This is already much better than 20 years ago, where it was one out of six. But this is far from what we have reached in Europe, including Switzerland, one out of 250. So let's put yourself in the shoes or in the tongues of a health worker based in Dar es Salaam, the biggest city in Tanzania. You are the one who will see all these sick children arriving to the dispensary. But all hopes of parents are lying on your shoulders and you have been sent to this poor area of the city with no supervision after only three years of practical training. You know elsewhere how much time it takes to train a physician, at least 12 years. But there are very few medical doctors in Tanzania. Imagine, it's like if for the whole city of Lausanne, we had only 10 medical doctors, of which five would be attending patients, and the other five having more urgent matters, you know, like politics or TED conferences. <laughs> so you are this health worker in the facility, you arrive in the morning and you see this long queue of mothers, fathers, siblings, carrying in their arm their sick child. They have arrived very early in the morning, they are waiting for you and they hope you will have time to see them before the end of the day. So you start with the first one. He looks a bit drowsy. You are worried and you realize that her front is really hot. So you ask the father, yes, indeed, the child has fever since yesterday, but he has also a bit of cough and a bit of diarrhea, and a bit of belly pain, and a bit of everything, like all sick children at that age. So you wonder, could this child have malaria? Because you know that malaria is killing a child in the world every 30 seconds? Sorry, here as a researcher I have to intervene. This is not true. No, this was maybe true Third, uh, 10 years ago, but now we have made a lot of progress as researcher, public health people, we have worked a lot and now it's much better. Children are dying of malaria only every minute. Okay, so I still have some job to do, I will not be fired right now. And what can we do? So, you cannot just continue to treat all these patients like if it was malaria. We need to bring something to this health worker to be able to know is that, if that child has malaria. But in fact, we have something, an incredible, simple, reliable and cheap tool that you can even do at the bedside of the patient. It's a rapid diagnostic test. We knew it well because we were using it for several years in, in travelers in Lausanne. And you know, it's the type of 
test that medical laboratory is not always like because it's too simple, too easy to perform. You just, you don't need to bleed the child. You just prick the finger, you take a drop of blood, you put it on the test, and after a few minutes, you have the result. I could even just teach you right now how to perform one. By the way, who in this room has been to the tropics already or is planning to go? Okay, for the few ones, you are very lucky. And if you want, I can show you how to do this test. You can take a few with you. Next time you go on your trip, this is what we do with travelers in Lausanne. So, before that, we have to go back to Tanzania. And we brought all these tests in the health facility. So now, remember, you are this health worker. You have this test. You perform it on the child. And after a few minutes, you know that the child has malaria or not. What? The result of the test is negative. And that's where you start to feel really bad. I mean, if it was positive, it's malaria, it's clear, you know what pills to give, and that's fine, but this child has the negative syndrome. That's how clinicians call it now. So, what should I do? Could this child have a serious bacterial infection? Should I give an antibiotic? Should I rather send him immediately to hospital? But, I mean, Dar es Salaam, the traffic is a nightmare, and today there has been so many rains. The roads are flooded. This child will take hours to arrive to the hospital. So, not only this health worker is depressed, because our team, our research team, was also quite depressed, but for totally different reasons. We were very happy we had introduced all these rapid tests and measured by three different ways how many antimalarials were prescribed in the city. And it had dropped a lot. We managed to convince clinicians to follow the test results, stop prescribing antimalarials to all, but at the same time we measured a huge increase in the antibiotic prescription. So the clinician had just instead of giving antimalarials, now antibiotics, so we just shift the problem of the risk of resistance from one to the other disease. We put now antibiotics at risk of not working at all in a few years, what is already going on right now in northern countries. So, we have to find something else. We have to find a new tool. We cannot ask this health worker to perform a different hundreds of lab tests for each bug existing on Earth. We even don't, don't do that in Switzerland for each febrile episode in a child. It's so frequent. But the first step was to find out which diseases are causing this fever. So we did a study. It's not trivial, in fact. It has never been done up to now, even in rich countries. So we did all this study. In fact, I know why nobody had done that before. I mean, just imagine the transport of the blood samples of all these children in my luggage. So I had to transport them from very remote rural Tanzania up to the high-tech labs in Switzerland. So first, with my luggage, I take the Tazara. The Tazara is the Tanzanian-Zambian railways. It's just the nicest, incredible train you can find in East Africa, really, if you have a chance to take it. It goes across very nice natural park. You can see the big animals, the sunset, back to work. So we did this study. We had tons of clinical and lab data in a big database, so we shake it all and created a very simple electronic decision chart. This is my luggage, because when I arrived in Switzerland, in fact, I had to take the Zurich Lausanne Intercity. I like public transport. And people were looking at me very 
especially because my luggage was covered by a layer of white ice and getting off some smoke. This is due to the minus 80 temperature we need to keep these samples to preserve the novel biomarkers we are looking at to try to um, predict severe disease. So we had all this data from the samples and we got this very simple electronic algorithm we can now put on smartphones and tablets. You know, in Tanzania, all clinicians have their smartphone at hand, generally not helping them really to concentrate on the work. But anyway, so now we give these tablets in the hands of the clinician, they have to introduce a few key clinical findings and they are guided to decide which point of care test to use, what is the probability of diagnosis, which is the best treatment, if they need to send the child to hospital. What? You want to transform me in a diagnostic machine? You are suggesting that all what I have learned during these years is nothing? That you can just replace me by a robot to do the job instead of me? This was the first reaction of the clinicians in Tanzania. But this is the same everywhere around the world when you bring new guidelines to clinicians that threat the medical art. So, you know, I mean, this is so complex data that you have to integrate that our busy brain cannot handle. Let's stop trying just to guess the diagnosis and let the machine help us a bit to integrate this information. We can even put sensor to measure some parameters of the child. And this time we can save, reallocate it to things that only human beings can do. This means the relationship with the patient. There is a lot to do. I mean, we have to find a new game to calm down the child before we can measure the respiratory rate. We need time to explain to parents what we will do to the child and what his child is really suffering from and what treatment he needs. In fact, we need most time to explain that he doesn't need treatment. Most of them don't need antibiotic. Just a lemon tea with honey will do the job in most cases. So we have now a nice tool that we can even use under the tree. There are solar panels in all villages now in Africa for the smartphones. And they get an accurate diagnosis. They can target the antibiotic on the children who really need it and know if they have to send the child to hospital. But such a tool can, in fact, do much more than that. All this data gathered by the clinician on the tablet can be simply sent to a central server in the office of the Ministry of Health. And you know, ministries of health right now, they, they work blindly. They have no data. They have no, no idea what is going on in the country. So to take decisions, it's quite difficult. While with this tool, they could even detect early warning signs of a new epidemic before it's too late. You see what I have in mind here. So let's convince our government from the north and the south to invest more on health at a global level, to stop not only the media-friendly epidemics, but also the silent ones that are killing children and their caretakers every day. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>